Good evening, everyone, once again, and a warm welcome to IMC's training program. So before we move on to our training session, uh, I will be just giving a brief introduction about international management consultancy. We are basically a startup uh, as of 2020, and we are based out of Abu Dhabi, uh, located in UAE. We are all about shaping successful transformations. IMC is a leading global provider of learning and instru instruction for professional qualifications. Our main motto is to connect students all over the world to the best of the instructors. We do everything that has to do with improving the performance of an individual, uh, in turn improving that of the organization that they work for. We provide training programs as well as consulting services. We basically offer training programs and skill developing certifications, which includes Lean Six Sigma. We uh, cover all the belts of Lean Six Sigma, that is yellow belt, green belt, black belt, and master black belt. We also focus uh, entirely on supply chain management and PMP. Uh, apart from other courses, we also have Prince2 and total quality management. Coming to our accreditations, uh, which is important to each and every one of uh, you associated with us. IMC is accredited by the highest industry standards. We put in the efforts and work to better ourselves uh, in order to prove our commitment to offering our clients only the best and of superior quality. Uh, out of our accreditations, uh, we are most proud of being associated with CPD as a member and also have, having our uh, courses certified by CPD. CPD is basically continually profession development, which is based out of United Kingdom and is an, is an avenue for professionalizing learning, basically. Uh, the next one, we have CSSE, which is the Council for Six Sigma Certification, which is also a large industry accreditation provider to colleges, universities, and private training organizations worldwide. Uh, this is based out of USA, and in order to be CSSE accredited, accredited our internal processes are also being continuously improved to meet the demands of the industry. We are also a member of IQF, which is International Quality Federation. Uh, this is also based out of USA and is an organization designed to connect quality professionals. We are also ISO certified, uh, particularly 9001-2015 certified, which means that we guarantee quality management system to improve processes and better decision making within the firm, which is obviously important as it directly results in deriving the best from our team to serve only the highest quality of products to our customers. So with that being said, we basically ensure quality and reassurance that our courses achieve the qualitative standards required for every student to achieve only the finest. As mentioned earlier, we are based out of Abu Dhabi and in order to establish an education institution over here, we have to meet the set standards of the related government bodies out of which uh, Abu Dhabi Center for Technical and Vocational Education and Training is the single highest standard that regulates and establishes standards for the quality of educational and vocational training programs provided by institutions here. We are proud to be the only activate approved institute in Abu Dhabi for our Lean Six Sigma, PMP and SCM courses. We're also associated and partnered up with other global and uh, local organizations like ISCL Global, Nokri Gulf, Limon, Fazza, et cetera, to better serve your needs. Talking about our presence, we are internationally recognized and globally present. We have catered to over 700 plus students 
uh, ranging from multiple areas like Canada, USA, the whole of Middle East, India, Philippines, etc. Coming to the IMC team, like any company, the people behind it are important as well. Uh, I'm pleased to introduce you to our top management, who is literally the guiding forces behind the success of this company. We have Mr. Mohammed Sajjad, who is the general manager, Ms. Deepa Meghwani, who is our quality head. We also have Mr. Shashank Pandey, our product head, and Mr. Farhan Ahmed, our academic director. This is our extended team who you have probably directly communicated once with or will hopefully in the future if you choose uh, to continue the Six, six Sigma belts with us. Uh, putting faces behind the names is always a great thing. We have our sales team here along with the operations team. So that is all about IMC and everything you need to know about. For more information, you can always visit our website, which is www.imcinstitute.ae. Thank you and a warm welcome once again for joining us today. I will now hand over the session to our trainer, Mr. Shashi Prakash, who will introduce himself and take over this program. Thank you, sir. Hi. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Shashi Prakash and uh, uh, I'm a Lean Six Sigma Master Black Belt. And uh, roughly I have like uh, over 19 plus years of work experience. And that's been primarily into the service industry. Uh, for good 14 years, I was engaged with the corporate sector, uh, managing quality compliance, legal stuff uh, for various corporates, uh, specifically American Express, uh, uh, US and Australia. Uh, since 2014, I have uh, been actively involved in management training and consulting, and that too only in Lean Six Sigma. That's the only area that I expertise in, and that's what I do. Uh, so pretty much with respect to Lean Six Sigma, I would have trained uh, people, like at, uh, at least 5,700 participants so far across various belts of Six Sigma, starting from a white belt, yellow belt, green belt, black belt, and master black belt. Uh, so if I talk about my current engagements, so uh, like we, we are into consulting for various uh, uh, corporates in uh, Europe, some publication houses in like, some uh, oil and natural gas uh, companies in uh, Qatar and some other Middle Eastern companies. Uh, within India, uh, I'm primarily uh, engaged with uh, almost all the IITs, IMs. We have done exactly the same trainings that we will be going through. So. Uh, the purpose of uh, having, like giving you this basic introduction was to make sure that, uh, as I told you in the beginning, that I come from service industry background and kind of industries that we cater to uh, is, is practically every other industry that you can think of. Six Sigma is a wonderful tool and I would congratulate you all for taking up this decision to take up Six Sigma because this will increase your chances of doing well in your career by multiple times. This is one skill which is demanded by almost all the stakeholders nowadays. There are a lot of uh, like business improvement tools which are available. We have project management, we have ISOs, we have uh, your uh, ITIL, and there are a lot of other agile framework. But Six Sigma happens to be one universal tool which fits in every industry. It is uh, without, it doesn't have boundaries. You can, you may be, working in, a, in any kind of industry, any kind of department, domain, role, it doesn't matter. Technically, you can render your services in anything that you think, like any industry that comes in, uh, you cater, like you, you wish to say, uh, I'm an HR professional and I want to do a, a project or Six Sigma implementation in operations or in finance and marketing, you can do that. There's no limitation once you are a Six Sigma professional. So that's why it increases your chance of doing well in your career. Uh, I today, like if I uh, talk about the clientele we, we deal, uh, it ranges from healthcare, hospitality, IT, manufacturing, uh, oil and natural gas, and there's no limitation to it. So my, my honest request in the very beginning from the onset is to make sure that please focus on the concept. You've taken out your uh, valuable time. Uh, it's very important that we must make this session uh, engaging. You must ask questions. That's my basic expectation from each and every one of you. Uh, once you ask questions, your concept will get clear. 
And uh, that's what is required uh, when you really want to gain that expertise in order to do well, take up this additional skill where, like, and add to your profile, you must get your concepts clear. You may be coming from any industry, any department, domain, but if you got your concepts clear, then there's no looking back. So please ask questions. That's the only expectation I have from uh, everyone. And having said that, uh, if at all you we feel that if from content perspective uh, or from the pace, the uh, like my, my pace or delivering the content, if you feel that's too fast or too slow, please do let me know. Uh, it's if you have a concern, please do bring it up right in the beginning so that uh, you don't miss out the, the time. So if you have a concern, please raise it. There's no question which is uh, unimportant. Like, so if you have a problem, if you have a question or concern, I will be more than happy to address it right then and there, rather than you waiting for the entire session and then having a problem. So uh, I hope that's a fair expectation from everyone. Is that is that okay with everyone? Yes, that's okay. Perfect. Sure. Yeah, Thank you. Please, Sushi. please. Okay. All right. So, uh, without uh, kind of delaying it any further, I would uh, there I would get started. Basically, uh, uh, there are a few things which I would definitely want to share, uh, uh, which we would require going forward uh, for future sessions. Today, it's going to be more of because we're getting started. So, it's more going to be on theory grounds, uh, some bit of basic introduction that we'll be covering up today. Uh, but yeah, going forward, we would definitely need you to access some, have some data files uh, to access. Uh, so I'll just share what uh, basic information that we would require. A, because it's a data-driven study, I'm sure you must have done some bit of study at your end. Where, so what is Six Sigma? What do we do with Six Sigma? So there's a basic uh, uh, tool which we use in Lean Six Sigma. Globally, when we talk about Lean Six Sigma, we all use our uh, statistical software, which is uh, Minitab. This is what is need of the hour. Uh, corporates want people who have a knowledge of using Minitab. That's what it would look like. I've shared the link. You can, uh, we do, you don't need this uh, today, but when, please get this downloaded by tomorrow uh, because during the session, because I don't want it to be a lecture, lecture kind of mode where I'm just talking and you probably listening to it. It'll be more, it'll be good when we, we do it and we learn it by doing it. So the right way to learn is by experiential learning. So please have this downloaded. It's a free trial version. You will be able to get for 30 days. Uh, you can log into this link, uh, fill in the details. It'll get downloaded, but yes, just park it for, you don't need it today for sure. So you can just copy this link and keep it with yourself and have this software installed uh, it's pretty pretty simple uh, self-explanatory so we can get this installed for tomorrow because it's all going to be data driven analysis reports everything will be carried out from this specifically corporates want people who have knowledge of minita that's the need of the hour so that's number one number two uh, i have uh, I, I will be using this sheet i'll be making some notations during the session so I will be sharing certain details, all these details with every one of you. So uh, I want you to focus on uh, asking questions. So the lot of notation notes I will be working on. So I'll keep sharing the notes by the end of the session. So please fill in this simple form. I'll just click on the form, show it to you. How does it look like? Uh, basic form, which so that I can get your uh, email IDs and I can share that uh, in this Excel sheet by end of every day. I'll keep sharing whatever we work on, whatever we discuss during the session. I'll keep sharing this. So it's a simple form. Do fill in uh, so that I get your details. I would specifically want your G the email IDs. Do don't share it here. Please uh, fill in the form. Just, just click on this link. It will open up this form. Uh, don't do it right now. Just keep a copy of it, make a copy of it, like and just uh, fill in the details so that I will have your email IDs and I can, by the end of every session, I will uh, attach the Excel sheet that whatever notes we have prepared and I'll email that to you. So you don't have to focus on making notes. I'm doing that for you while we discuss and when we discuss, uh, go through the training session. So you can just focus on asking questions. That's, that's, what, more is, uh, that's what is important. So these are two things. Uh, other than this, what I would uh, wanted to kind of talk about is, uh, yeah. 
So there is some training material which has been shared by IMC. You all have access to the training material. That's your reference guide. That's the actual reference guide that you should be looking at uh, for detailed analysis. But yes, out of that, that uh, training material, I have created some slides, some bullet points, and there are certain data files also, which I would request you all to download. This is what I'll be using during the session. So I am sharing this link. You can click on this link. It will, it will you'll be able to download this folder. Let me show it to you. The folder you will be able to download would be this one. Okay, that's the folder. When you when you click on this link, you'll be able to download this particular folder. Uh, let me quickly navigate what's there in the folder so that we know what we'll be covering in. So it's within this folder, you'll get some Excel files which will be required during the training session. So will be, as I said, it's gonna be more of an experiential thing. So you'd know all the data files, templates, trackers, what we will be using during the training session. So all that we will be using. So you need to have these files so that we can work on the Minitab software that I talked about. So all these files which we need. Secondly, it has got a sample file which you can use for making a simulation project. As a real world project will happen, You, uh, how do Six Sigma projects are carried out? To this. So this is a sample file, how a project uh, is created. So we'll, we'll cover this up because we will be using this sample file and a sample project, how a Six Sigma project looks like is like this. So I have, I'll be sharing a sample file also. This is how a Six Sigma Greenbelt project would look like. This is what you will be doing in real world. When you work on a Lean Six Sigma project, you will be creating something like this. So what you learn and you start implementing in real world, this is how you will be creating a Products. We'll learn about, about all of it. It's all created from Minitab, all the rules, analysis, and everything. So pretty much uh, you have a copy of uh, this particular project, which is uh, so that you have a fair bit of idea. Uh, once you learn and you go back to your, in the, your companies, your industries, you are supposed to carry out some Six Sigma project. How does it look like? And sample file for you to work on so that you get an idea of it. So this same file, was used to create this project by one of the participants. So that's that's about it. Uh, other than this, as I said, there's some training material that's already been shared by IMC. That's your primary reference material. You should be looking at that reference material for in-depth study. But yes, from that detailed training material, I have created some bullet points. And this is these are the bullet slides that I'll be using uh, to carry on the session. So I, I have also shared this in this zip file. So when you download, you'll be getting all of it. So A, the Excel files, B, the simulation project file data, and the slide that I'll be using during the training session. So I hope we all clear. So these are three pieces of information. One is the link for Minitab. Uh, when you click on this, this is the link for Minitab. Let me quickly show this to you. That's the Minitab site. You just need to fill in the basic details and you will be able to download the setup and it'll get installed. You just need to follow the instructions. It'll get installed. So secondly, the form for me to email the Excel files every day, whenever the session gets over. And third, this WeTransfer link is there for you to download the material, which we will be using during the training session. So we just a basic form and you fill it up and it'll get downloaded on your system. Uh, is everyone okay with it? Anyone has any questions on these three pieces of information that we talked about. Is uh, is it clear to everyone? Okay. Yeah, it's fine, it's yeah. fine, it's yeah, fine. Right. But we need to make sure that we are going to get the link for download. Yeah, so I, I just email, I just uh, me, uh, messaged this in the chat window, uh, all these three links. Let me just put together all these three links, put in one row and then, so in the in the chat, so I would yeah, still but, need. Yeah, yeah, but if you share it by email, it will be better for us because maybe some people are using mobile, same like me. Okay, some okay, got it. So, uh, I would I, I would uh, need your email IDs. So for that, I would please do one thing. Please fill in the form so that I can. Let me let me just uh, just fill in this form. Rest I will I will when I'm sending this Excel sheet, I will be sharing these links. Just fill in this quick form. Uh, and you just need to have mandatory only two things: your a your name and your email ID. That is all. Just just submit that your name and the email ID, and that is all. Just submit it. There's nothing else which is required. Okay. 
Perfect. So just, just fill in this name and email ID and the uh, rest I will email every other uh, link that you need to have because I it's clearly understood that yes, some people might be using phone, uh, but going forward for future sessions, uh, I guess you would need Minitab for that. You might have to kind of use a proper laptop or a desktop for future sessions. I hope uh, we clear about this now. Okay, I guess. Okay. Yeah, it's fine. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, uh, let's go back and get started with the session now. Uh, okay, now, uh, first of all, again, I'm sure like uh, we we all have a fair bit of idea what is Lean Six Sigma, even if we don't have uh, any idea about Lean Six Sigma, that's still fine because we are starting from scratch, absolute scratch. So there's no problem. We will be covering up from the uh, from the beginning, but just to have a basic idea, uh, what in your understanding is Lean Six Sigma one word or the two different words, Lean and Six Sigma? Please, uh, I guess as, as I requested, please interact. Yeah, so it's two different words. Yes, absolutely. The two different words. So lean and six sigma, the two different words. Can anyone tell me what is lean and what is six sigma? It's it's fine. So whatever you have and know of lean and what is whatever you know of six sigma, just just please, it'll be good to know because it's see, it's all about getting into more of interaction mode to make sure that we can make best out of this time. So please, please share. There's no, uh, nothing, process improvement, perfect. But what, lean is all about waste. Thanks, Shirley, you've kind of mentioned it correctly. Uh, lean is all about waste. Uh, how, uh, Roman, you talk about process improvement. Are you talking about lean or are you talking about Six Sigma? Six Sigma, okay, perfect. Uh, so this is about, this is what you mentioned about uh, waste and removal and lean is defined as set as management practices to improve efficiency and effectiveness by eliminating waste. Lean is all about manufacturing. Okay, perfect. So we've, we've got basic idea about like everyone has got some bit of basic idea of what is lean and what is Six Sigma. First thing first, we are clear that lean and Six Sigma, they're two different words. And now I would try to go and put together uh, the, a basic definition of this uh, it, in, a, in a more refined way, how a recruiter, like see, keep keeping in mind, a lot of people might have taken this up uh, for switching a job, going for a different, looking for a different job. So recruiters ask this question uh, and they're looking for certain specific set of uh, words, unless and until you don't give a proper uh, answer, the answer is still incomplete for them. So uh, I'm just like, whatever you just mentioned, this is absolutely correct. We'll just try to kind of refine and give you a, a proper uh, like definition as to what is lean and what is Six Sigma in a layman language. If you have to explain what is lean and what is Six Sigma uh, to a common person, how would you be able to define it? This is, uh, we were trying to understand, say, uh, first of all, lean is identification and elimination of waste from the process to increase efficiency without compromising on the quality of product or service. So in a nutshell, we're talking about it's an it's it's all about identification and elimination of waste from a process which will increase the efficiency the real term we're looking for is that it lean works on increasing efficiency by removing the waste from the process while we do this we don't want to compromise on the quality of your product or service whatever industry you're working in we don't want to compromise on the quality of the product or service so like, let's try to figure out what what do we mean by this Say I have a process, I'm making a product or I'm delivering a service, whatever it may be. Say there are multiple steps. I start with my step A, then go to step B, C, D, E, and F. Say this is where I start my process and this is where my, I end my process. Either I'm making a product or I'm delivering a service. Say for example, it takes me 15 days time. This is current scenario. Now by the virtue of lean knowledge, 
I would try to identify is the step number A, is it a waste or not? Is it step number B, is it a waste? So once we, with, by the virtue of lean knowledge, say for example, I identify that this step B is a waste. I have identified a waste and I've removed a waste. Now my process looks like this, A, C, D, E, and F. Whatever product or service I was delivering, I haven't compromised with that and I'm able to finish this job in now 10 days. That's about lean. Lean is all about cutting down the time. Lean is all about time, nothing else. Lean is all about speed of the process. In nutshell, when we talk about lean, the basic fundamental is, can you deliver product or service service basically then you deliver the product or service faster without compromising on quality what we want to understand why implementation of lean lean is all about time can you deliver it faster lean is all about cutting down the unnecessary waste say you identified this step as a waste now i would like to cut it down this was an unnecessary thing, which was eating up five days. It was some step which was consuming some time, money, resource, raw material, which was not required, but we were doing it, which was consuming some time. So what we have done by removing this waste, we have optimized the efficiency. The efficiency of the process has increased. Efficiency increased in terms of cost, time, your resource, efforts, everything. You saved on everything. So this is all about lean. Lean increases the efficiency of the process. Optimization of the process in terms of efficiency is like will be referred with like will be linked with the lean term. Lean is all about time. Can you deliver it sooner? That's all about a process improvement methodology. In nutshell, when we go to Six Sigma, this is absolutely different. This has nothing to do with the way lean works. This, this works on efficiency and this works on effectiveness. That's the basic difference your recruiter would ask you. In a Six Sigma kind of interview, recruiters do ask this question. What does Six Sigma work on? Efficiency or effectiveness? We should know the basic definition, basic difference between efficiency and effectiveness. Efficiency of the process is enhanced by optimizing the existing resources. You've kind of saved on cost, time, and everything. So this was all about lean. Effectiveness is how good or bad you are. Like when you talk about my, my quality percentage is so-and-so. That is what we talk about, how effective you are. What is your fail percentage? That talks about how, how good or bad you are. So bottom line, when we talk about quality percentage, fail percentage, that tells how effective you are, how good or bad you are. So Six Sigma, what does it work on? It increases the effectiveness, increases the quality of the process. How does it do it? Lead Six Sigma works on increasing, so it's a data-driven approach to reduce variation. When I write variation, I'll be mentioning defect and we'll understand why. It, it's a data-driven approach to reduce variation in a process to increase effectiveness. Now, when we say variation, I've mentioned that variation as a defect. Why is that a defect? What is this all about? Like practically, let's understand in a simple uh, term. Uh, but before that, I just want to hear from you all. Like if somebody knows, is there a number which is associated when I say my process is working at six sigma level? Has anyone, like have you come across a number other than six? Uh, what is the performance level at six sigma? Uh, anyone knows about that? What is the level of performance at six sigma level? 99.03% if I've got it, but right. 99 point? 99.36%. 36 96%. Uh, so it's 96%. Okay, 99.96%. Nine, that's what you're saying. Okay. Uh, uh, okay. So when I say my process is working at six sigma level in percentage, my quality percentage, this is my quality percentage at six sigma level is 99.99966%. That's the level of quality in terms of percentage in Six Sigma. 
this is the level of quality. So yes, we should know this. Why? Because again, interviewers do ask this question. So wherever it's important from a uh, job perspective, yes, there are certain questions recruiters are very, very finicky about. Yes, we should know these numbers. Other than this, I will try to understand how big is the number, how good is this number? We definitely want to understand this. But just along with this, and remember a few more numbers which are associated with Six Sigma. Generally, there's a term called 3.4 DPMO. I'm not sure how many of us would have heard about this. This is the level of Six Sigma. What does it mean? 3.4 defects per million. Defects per million. Yes. Opportunity. opportunity. Now, to under, what did this mean? That if I were given 1 million opportunities, I will make 3.4 defects out of 1 million. It doesn't, it, it's almost a zero defect. In a 1 million, 3.4 defects doesn't even stand a chance. It's nothing. It's negligible. And that's the level of Six Sigma. So just let's, let's understand how good or bad is Six Sigma. Say, for example, I appeared for an exam and I scored 99% marks in an exam. Just, just for an argument's sake. What it means that I'm 99% effective, that is my 99% is my pass percentage. What's my fail percentage here? 1%. 1%. What, what does it mean? I, I failed one out of 100. I could not achieve one out of 100. So if I failed one out of 100, how much, what would my failure rate in a million? Anyone can tell me this, this is 10,000, uh, 100,000. Answers like, I guess we've got 1 million. Yes, we've got 1 million. If I make one error or one defect out of 100, how many defects will I make out of a million? At the same rate, if one defect, if I make, yes, thanks, Erwin, you're right. I will be making 10,000 defect in a million. So 99% marks, which looks very good. It tells me that if I make 90, if I have perform at 99% quality or I secure 99% marks, that means I have a failure rate of 1%. 1% means one out of 100. And if I make one defect out of 100, out of million, I'll be making 10,000 defects. And just put it, put next to it six sigma level. This is what we're comparing it with. At six sigma level, we just make 3.4 defects. 99% which was looking good or great is looking horrible now. There's no comparison. In six sigma level, you just make 3.4 defects in a million. Here we're talking about 10,000 defects. It's a huge number. So 99% kind of quality was a great quality about a decade ago, probably in 1990s or two, year 2000. That was great at that point in time. It's, it's outdated. Nobody cares for 99% kind of quality because this is huge number, huge risk. So yes, Six Sigma happens to be the, the way people want their organization to be, or like they want organizations to operate at this level. But another question just definitely want to ask, is this the best level or best performance level? Have you heard about anything better than Six Sigma or is it possible to get better than Six Sigma level? Are there industries working better than Six Sigma? Anyone has heard about anything which is better than Six Sigma? Not, not, not really, not really. Okay. We have not heard okay. about that. Okay. Um, uh, okay. Let me just kind of mention this name. There are industries. Absolutely, surely. Thank you. So, aviation industry. You. This. This works at around twelve sigma level. Your pharmaceutical industry. They work around ten to eleven sigma. Six sigma is horrible. Horrible for them. You trust. You would not board a plane when you know out of ten. One, like 1 million flights, 3.4 flights will crash. You would not take that flight. You would refrain from taking up a plane if you know this is the, this is the failure rate. So this industry, because every defect is a big, like it's, it's a very big blunder. It is, it is a life and death situation. You cannot afford Six Sigma level at a, in an aviation kind of industry because this life and death at stake. It's, it's a very, very crucial industries. You cannot afford to work at Six Sigma. It's horrible for them. Pharmaceutical industry, like we talked about this COVID vaccine, why there is so much of delay? Why not just have this vaccine and give it to people? No. If What if you end up like giving these vaccines to people and they will, so many people can die. 
again, life and death situations. These industries cannot afford even a single defect. This is horrible for them. But yes, this is very, very selective. Very few industries like aviation, pharma, bio labs, they only work with this kind of high performance level. And this is where everything gets automated. Nothing is manually driven. You need, when you need to get to this level of Sigma, it has to be pure automation. But yes, for barring these specific industries, everything for everyone else, Six Sigma is a dream. Six Sigma is a journey where everyone wants to take it up, their organization too. So if you, if I talk about industry average, it's about three, three and a half Sigma. That's what we've put together, keeping these industries aside. Overall average is about three, three and a half Sigma. So every industry wants to, every company wants to get up to the level of Six Sigma. Uh, but the basic question comes to mind, like why Six Sigma only? Why not Five Sigma? Why not Seven Sigma? Why do we call it a Six Sigma? Let's just understand so that we understand the basic concept. There is something called zero sigma. There is one sigma also, two sigma, three sigma, four sigma, five sigma, six sigma, seven, eight, nine. It's a scale. It's a scale. That's it. Similarly, we have negative also. Minus one, minus two, minus three. Similarly, this is, this is just telling you a performance level. At what sigma level, how many errors would you make? How many defects would you make? What is your pass percentage? What is your fail percentage? This is a scale which just tells you at six sigma level, we know we will be making how many defects? 3.4 defects Four. in a million defects, in million opportunity. That's what it tells you. So it's just a scale at six sigma level. This is the my performance level. And when your organization has 50% defect, you will have zero sigma. If, if your process has 50% defect, your, your performance level will be at zero. You will be able to calculate this like, like when we, in the third or fourth session, pretty much when we uh, get there, you will be able to calculate sigma level for anything and everything that comes to your mind, everything. So it's that easy. Bottom line for now, just wanted to understand that we are talking about a, a methodology, which is six sigma. It's just a number on a scale, which tells you, how bad are you? It just measures the defect rate. This is 3.4 defect. This is 50% defect. So as your sigma level increases, your, your defect decreases. So sigma increases, defect decreases. Yes. And this will be reverse. If your deep process has more than 50% defect, your sigma level will go in negative. So higher the defect, lesser the sigma. So your defect, when it gets, gets more than 50%, your sigma level will tend to get in negative. So every sigma level has a certain number of defect as linked with it. At what sigma level you are, you will be able to calculate everything. Say if I want to calculate how much, what is my sigma level for my office reporting time? I leave from my home, I reach my office. There's a timeline I have to meet. What is my sigma level for that? You can calculate sigma level for everything. It's that easy. But yeah, it'll come with like when we get into third or fourth session. But for now, just keep this in mind. Why people then stick to six sigma? Why not seven sigma? Just because that be up to six sigma, you can improve your process with basic process improvement methodologies, with basic uh, your tools and techniques, statistics, quality management tool, project management tool. You can improve a process and take it up to the level of six sigma without too much of investment. But beyond six sigma, it technically gets very, very difficult for you to reduce it any further. And then you need automation. Generally beyond Six Sigma, you need to go for automation to reduce any further defect. And that calls for huge investment. Would you care about, like say you are a manufacturing uh, a pen, would you care about investing millions of dollars to save 3.4 defective pens? I would not. So it's more of the return on investment beyond that. Yeah, with basic investment, basic process improvement stuff, I can take it up to this level. Beyond that, I don't want. But yes, aviation and pharma, such critical industries, every single defect is a huge cost. They would have, they have no choice. They have to go for automation. So yeah, beyond this, technically you need automation. Hence, this was set as a benchmark for everyone, as a, as a benchmark for every other other industry barring them as six sigma so that's that's why they started mentioning it as six sigma not five sigma not seven sigma because up to this level you can go ahead and improve your process without not, not too much of effort or without not too much of uh, investment so from that perspective six sigma works fine
uh, in, for every industry. So that is basic, basic uh, like idea of what is lean and what is Six Sigma. Uh, I hope that basic understanding that's clear to everyone. Is it is it okay? Or it, like, if you have any questions, please do. Uh, yes, it is fine. It is fine. Okay, perfect. So we'll. Uh, so this is the again. I'll. It's in that slides that I'll be sharing. We'll have all this information that I'm just talking about. Uh, so efficiency and effectiveness, just keep this in mind. They're two separate stuff that we'll be dealing with. Uh, same stuff, lean is all about speed of the process. Six Sigma works on stability, how accurately you would deliver without variation. Variation is what Six Sigma works on. Anything which is not desired by the client is a variation. So Six Sigma helps you reduce the variation. Anything which is not expected by the client, that's what is any defect is a variation. So practically, you want to reduce the defect to increase the quality. And you do it by statistical approach, by data-driven analytics, uh, which comes into picture. So that's more about that. Uh, we won't do too much of deep dive into history per se, because that's not what is relevant in the real world. Uh, but yes, we should know some basic whereabouts, how Lean started, how Six Sigma started. Again, from job interview perspective, some recruiters do have this uh, so like affinity towards history. So yeah, basics of it, we do definitely want to understand. So history of lean is what we'll start with because lean is what gave birth to Six Sigma. And that's what we'd like to connect the story, how lean gave birth to Six Sigma. So we'll start with lean first. So history of lean. So th this dates back somewhere around 1908 time frame, which started with Henry Ford. So Henry Ford with the Ford Motors this is where it started from. So Ford Motors, these guys were uh, pioneer in uh, car manufacturing. But at that point in time, they, globally, wherever, whosoever was into car manufacturing, they were into a car manufacturing model called craft modeling. Craft model means you, they, were, they used to make a car at one place. So this is how it used to, I'll just try to kind of put together something which makes sense. Let me uh, just try to. So this is say one car is being made here. Car one is here. Car two is made somewhere here at a, at some dif different place. Like it's a little far off from there. Third car is somewhere here. So similarly, the cars were stationary. These cars were fixed. They were fixed and basically they were stationary at one place. And people used to move from one car to another car. So if I'm fitting in bulb in a car, so I will move with all the bulbs from one car to another car will drag the, the luggage of all the spare parts. Somebody is fitting in tire with moving all the tires from one car to another, which was very, very slow process. And because of dragging that uh, spare parts and all that, it used to cause a lot of damage to the parts. It was slow and was to, it was causing a lot of damage. It was, it's, it's as per the published numbers, Ford used to make about 32 to 35 cars per month as, as uh, before, they got into this lean kind of concept. This was what they used because lean is all about time. And that's what I mentioned. Lean is all about time. These guys just changed the way they were operating. What they did is they got this model, which, which is used even till date by every possible industry, which is uh, assembly line, which we call as conveyor belt. Basically they introduced a conveyor belt. And what was done, Instead of people moving from one car to another, they just changed. This was person one. This was person two. This is person two, person three, and person four. So say, for example, and they introduced a moving belt, a moving automated belt. Uh, this was a moving belt. The car comes in front of this person. This person has to fit in bulk. He fits in bulk. The car moves to the next person. Then with the same sort of manpower without too much of heavy investment with just the way of changing instead of car fixed and people moving with their luggage they ensured that people were made stationary and they started moving the car on a on a moving belt which speeded the process and their production increased three to four four times they increased the production and that started with mass production concept globally this was a new method people everywhere used to move and peep the parts which were manufactured they were kept the parts were kept at one place here for the first time parts were moving and people were stationary so there was this speeded the process there was not no more damage done to the spare parts because they had all the
the parts with them. They just need to fix and the car used to move, which increased the production. It was a globally, not only the car manufacturing industry, other industries also learned, okay, yes, this can be done this way without too much of investment and without just by changing the way we do it, they, they could optimize and everyone started doing mass mass production, huge uh, like uh, cars, like they were, like they were, they started even manufacturing about one thirty plus cars per month. There was one time where they they were they were operating at peak levels. This was a game changer, definitely. Everyone understand, but till uh, post this this World War sort of thing, uh, night around post nineteen forty five time frame, these there was the biggest name and fame, and the real world of lean, the lean term was unknown till this point when Toyota picked it up. Toyota, these people are were the best ones who actually defined the term called lean and they created something called TPS, which is still late used by everyone globally in the automotive sector. It's called Toyota Production System. It is the best known collection system of lean tools. All the lean tools, how it can be used, the best way to learn it is Toyota Production System. These guys mastered it. And just to kind of give you a quick background of it, how these Japanese people kind of mastered this art and created this new concept called lean, which changed the way industry used to work. Uh, post the Second World War, when this Japan was bombarded, things were like devastated. And if you talk about the area of Japan, if you put together all the islands, the area of Japan is almost equal to the, the state of California and US. But unfortunately, almost like 35 to 40% of the area in Japan is inhabitable. There are a lot of volcanoes, there are a lot of islands where people don't live, it's inhabitable. So as a country, unfortunately, they are not uh, like blessed with natural resource like oil and all. So as a country, they had less of resources, uh, capital investment was less because of the bombarding things, economy had crippled. As a country, they would have filed bankruptcy, they would have, they, they would have like gone. But the, like these guys knew only one way. I cannot compete. The, I'm talking about specifically the Toyota people. We cannot compete with big giants like Ford because we don't have that kind of capital investment. So we can't uh, mass produce so many cars. We do not have uh, the infrastructure and all that stuff. So the only way we can compete and beat our competition is by quality. With limited resources, we need to bring best out of nothing. That's what the concept is. And that like the, it's always said necessity is the mother of invention they had no choice so with whatever they had they had to bring best and lean is what they were able to put together all best tools the way can everything can be optimized in the best possible way they created this Toyota production system so if anyone wants to learn lean this is what you need to understand that this is how lean was used and Ill, till date globally people want learn lean through the Toyota production system because there's nothing be better way of doing uh, implementing lean these guys definitely made a big deal out of it uh, they captured the market and they captured the market big time uh, ford started bleeding big time they short started losing market shares the investors in, uh, in in europe in us they started investing in the japanese companies and they were flooded the capital risk issue was resolved they started booming big time and market share was big captured by the Japanese companies, including these Toyota people. Uh, now, this gave like uh, this gave birth to Six Sigma. Why? Because these people, Japanese were like uh, not only in the Toyota car manufacturing sector, but in every sphere. World for everyone else, lean was an unknown, anonymous thing which had come from nowhere. And somehow, these Japanese people had mastered the art. Uh, they were able to produce you know, like uh, goods which were cheaper, more reliable, customers were happy, um, investors were happy, everyone was happy. So pretty much everyone wanted Japanese product. Nobody wanted a European product or US product. It was, it, every industry was bleeding. And similarly, the big name, uh, can anyone tell me where did Six Sigma start? Anyone has an idea? Where did Six Sigma start? Any rough idea? Where did it start? Six Sigma, which company? Thank you, Shirley. Yes, it started with Motorola. Now, Motorola was a big giant, a big giant in, in, the, in the industry. And they were famous for two things. They had complete monopoly in the market for two things. One was Pager. Uh, so I'm not sure how many of us would have used Pager uh, because uh, like we, we got into the cell 
phone area, but yeah, earlier people used to use those pagers. So they were, they had complete monopoly. And second, they were into walkie-talkie, which was used by police officials, security guards everywhere globally. Even if you, if you want to check it out, if you want to go on YouTube and search for videos uh, related to uh, like the first satellite which landed on moon, the communication uh, which happened from moon to NASA, the, you can see the, the walkie-talkie which is used by, from the NASA. It has a Motorola logo on it. So they were there that big. They were used globally. They were omnipresent. Now, Motorola started getting tough competition from Japanese counterpart. They were big time. The investors were losing faith because Motorola products had complaints, had issues, but they had initially, they had monopoly customers, they had no choices. But now these, uh, these Japanese companies had come up or eventually, and they were giving tough competition. Japanese product pages, walkie talkies, they were cheaper, reliable, no complaints. Pretty much customer wanted that. And then the investors started funding them. Motorola was in a big, big trouble. And they would have gone and filed bankruptcy if this would have continued the same way. That was, this is published by the, when it was when they were going through this turmoil time. This is when the, some few, few names we should remember. Uh, Bob Galvin. Bob Galvin was the CEO of Motorola who called upon uh, this gentleman, Bill Smith. Bill Smith is known as father of Six Sigma. This is where, and there's another gentleman, now he's doctor, at that point in time he was not, Dr. Michael Harry, spelled as M-I-K-E-L. Dr. Michael Harry was co-architect of Six Sigma, so he's, I would say, assistant scientist. So Bill Smith was the senior scientist, he was assistant scientist. They were given this uh, responsibility to come up with something uh, which can be the so-called lean, which is unknown to everyone. So pretty much they wanted to come up with something. Otherwise, their existence was at stake. The company would have filed bankruptcy. Things were going out of proportion. Uh, investors were pulling out money from Motorola. So these guys eventually came in 1986 and declared, yes, yes, they have come up with something called Six Sigma. They announced it to the world that we have implemented and we have benefited. We have proven direct information that this is something which can give you 99.99966% kind of quality. Well, lean can get you up to sort of maximum 99% kind of quality. This even took Japanese by surprise that is that also possible? Well, this was an eye opener for everyone. Well, this is also, this kind of quality was unheard of. That nobody would have ever thought or imagined that this kind of performance is also possible. Well, Motorola regained everything that they lost. Fortunately, yes, it was a big shock to the lean world and specifically to the Japanese companies who were primarily uh, like on lean the system. These people re like revived everything for the uh, rest of the industry. And thanks to Bob Galvin, this gentleman was a noble guy who never patented this, this uh, Six Sigma, never kept it as complete proprietary information. This gentleman invited everyone from every other industry to come visit Motorola facility, see what is this Six Sigma, how they have managed to implement Six Sigma. It was a new thing for everyone. So they conducted a lot of seminars and all. So they invited everyone. So good guy wanted everyone to benefit. And uh, finally, bigger names than Motorola stepped in. We still have ABB, Asian Brown Boundaries list, listed everywhere in the stock exchanges. It's still there, ABB. We had Allied Signal. We have few names. These are big names which eventually got into this. We have Honeywell. These are three big names which stepped in and adopted Six Sigma. And their uh, numbers which they reported were even better than Six Sigma because of the magnitude. And it's 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 reported as per like what, what's the reported numbers of Motorola is that they saved, I'm talking about cost saving, not about revenue, cost saving because of Six Sigma projects, $17 billion. I'm just talking about Motorola. This is reported numbers in white papers. They have kind of published this in many forums that Motorola saved about $17 billion by implementation of uh, this is not revenue again, cost saving because of Six Sigma. This is huge. And finally, the biggest giant out of all of them stepped in, which was GE, General Electric. They picked up Six Sigma uh, in the end. This is the biggest, uh, like finally the big giant who stepped in around 1995, 96 timeframe. This, the owner of uh, the CEO was Jack Welch, well-known personality globally. He stepped in. G uh, is a company which which takes time to adopt something because when they do it in the
the state follows it. And that's what happened. The, the trend was set by G. People, when we talk about Six Sigma today, trust the biggest names of Six Sigma who are uh, who have made a name for themselves will find, find everyone tracing back to GE. GE is where they really make a big deal out of it. Even till date, you want to join General Electric. If you do not have Six Sigma certification, you cannot get into any management role, any management role for whatsoever. They live Six Sigma. That's how it is. The culture in, in GE is Six Sigma even till date. So there's no better place in terms of learning implement uh, the Six Sigma implementation other than G. They, the culture, everyone talks about Six Sigma, everyone deals with Six Sigma. So this is how they, these guys made it mandatory for any management role, you've got to be, and still they, they follow the same, same process. So these guys were the trendsetters, but one thing just wanna make sure that uh, why we're kind of mentioning GE, because they have a role to play in Six Sigma journey. Now, before GE stepped in, they were, we will be learning six segments and they, it has five different phases. We have D, M, A, I, and C. There are five different phases. First phase is called define phase. Then we have measure, we have analyze, we have improve phase, and we have control. So six sigma, we will be studying in five different phases, which is DMAC. Before GE picked it up, six sigma had just four phases. This is what Motorola created and ABB, Allied Signal, everyone was using just M-A-I-C. This was added by G. Now, this was added and it became DMAC. Earlier it was just M-A-I-C. Now, just want to make sure that you under understand what is the basic differentiation? What do we do in every phase? What is the purpose of it? In defined phase, it's all about project management. 100% project management, nothing else. This is statistical. Stats will start here and will go until the end. First is all about project management. So when Six Sigma was started, it was all statistical, 100% statistical. GE, where they said, well, uh, let's understand what do we do in every phase and we'll be able to understand why GE added defined phase there. Uh, in defined phase, we select the right project. In measure phase, we collect data about the problem. In analyze phase, we use statistical tests to find root causes. In improve phase, we improve the root causes. And basically, whatever is the, we fix, we attain the solution, whatever we get, uh, we improve the process. And finally, in control phase, we sustain the improvement. We don't want the improvements to uh, lose again. So sustain the improvements. But GE said, when you say that you could collect the data about the problem, uh, you have not done any due diligence here. So you have a problem and you start doing a project, but you do not have luxury of so much of money and time. You, you have limited resources. You have limited time. You have limited money. As a business, you may be having 20 problems. How did you select a particular project? Did you do any due diligence? What methods did you adopt before selecting this problem? So did you do justice to the money and time? No. So they said like, you are missing a very important thing, which is selecting the right project. I can Im implement Six Sigma in every pro for every problem and I will get benefit. But for some problem, I may get X reward, some, some problem, I may get double the rewards. I need to understand with that limited money, I need to optimize and get the maximum out of that resources, time and money. So selection of right project is even more critical to understand what I is that we are going to improve. Once we select that, then we go for statistical methods. So this is where GE changed the trend and they've since then, how to apply Six Sigma for an individual project. So. Uh, so we will be selecting, we'll be going for, we'll be looking at various techniques which is used uh, um, to select the project metric, how we, uh, how we eventually, you may be having a lot of problems, but how do you select the most critical problem? We'll be learning about all, the, all that, Mr. Raju. I hope that's clear, that's okay. We'll be, we'll be covering that up. Okay, perfect. So that's more about how did the, uh, the history of Six Sigma started and all that stuff. Uh, yeah, so pretty much this is all what we had in the history per se. Uh, anyone has any questions about history of Lean or Six Sigma, please just pitch in, and we'll move on to the next topic.
anyone has questions or are we if in case we're clear we and do let me know in case you're okay with the pace or you're okay with the pace of the content and the pace my pace also like in terms of the delivery is that okay with everyone okay please thank you thank you all right so next thing we would like to understand is see six sigma is understood and perceived by different people differently it's very important like if we how industry wise different people have categorized six sigma we need to understand that so if you want to understand a basic categorization of six sigma six sigma can be classified as four different types and that's what we'll try to kind of cover up first six sigma is used as a problem solving methodology as a tool as a technique to solve a business problem so please keep this in mind during the entire training program or even after that Whenever you will refer to why, whenever we say why, why means a business problem. This business problem can be any business problem for you want to implement a Six Sigma. You have a problem which you want to solve and you would like to use a Six Sigma project for that. This why could be uh, high cost. This could be revenue challenges. This could be customer satisfaction. This could be uh, probably absenteeism, attrition, uh, anything which is there in your average handling time, any problem for which is bothering you as a business, which is output, absolutely, Ganesh. So any output which is concerning the business is will be referred as Y. What Six Sigma says is that it is an outcome of X, function of X. And these X's are multiple X's. X1, X2 till the nth X, lot of X's combined together to produce this Y. Now, if you're not happy with this why, don't curse this why. This is just an output. This is an outcome of various X's. Understand where is what is causing this why to look bad. This is not looking good. So you, you have a huge cost. Your cost is out of control. This is just an output. Don't curse that you have out of your, your cost is out of control. No, understand what's causing it. Root cause. That's what Six Sigma talks about. It's a problem solving methodology. Uses, use this as a tool or a technique to solve your business problem, but do not try to solve it superficially. And for that, I will briefly tell you like very short story, but that's what is required for us to understand how do we go ahead and implement Six Sigma. The mindset needs to change. The mindset of approaching a problem needs to change in Six Sigma when we are going to go with Six Sigma approach. So a quick story. A fictional but a relevant one. Uh, this story is about a museum somewhere in Europe. Uh, this museum had like these tourists coming from every part of the world. It was very famous. Uh, so the owner of the museum was like really happy because they were very profitable. Uh, one fine day, this owner of the museum was going through all his accounts, books, financial records, and he saw that every month there was a cost of repainting the museum, repainting the museum. Well, he was not concerned with the amount of money because they were really profitable. But out of curiosity, he wanted to know why would you repaint the museum every month? So he called the manager. Like, why are you repainting the museum every month? So this manager replied that somehow the front portion of the museum, the front left portion, that becomes dull. That becomes out like our it becomes yellow or like it like the paint gets taken off. Something goes wrong with the left portion. It looks old. So he said, "Why only left portion?" He said, "Yeah, I don't know. Like we tried to figure it out, we could not. So we can't take chances. It's like tourists are coming, so we get it repainted. And obviously, you can't just repaint one portion again. It will look odd. So we get everything repainted." He said, "Yeah, you're doing a great job, but let's find out why only the front left portion." That becomes dull. So they call a consultant from outside. So now this consultant starts its bit of investigation. He speaks with the official, the owner, the manager, and everyone. By the end of the day, even he could not figure out why only the left portion was becoming dull. So by the end of the day, he was concluding his report that the only solution is to get it repainted. And just for the sake of asking, without any hopes, with no hopes, just for the sake of asking, he asked the caretaker of the museum, would you know why that left portion becomes dull? So now this caretaker shows him the left portion, says, can you see a lot of pigeons in the left portion? He said, yeah, these pigeons, they actually defecate, they poop, and they make the wall dirty. And because of which we have to clean up the wall, so we 
use a chemical, we keep using it, and because of which it becomes dull. We said, well, the mystery has been solved. Destroy the pigeon nest, no more, no more pigeons, and it will be taken care of. He said, no, no, no. Would you know why would pigeons be there? Because they are getting the easy food. You destroy the nest, they will come back again. He said, then let's do one thing. They'll, they'll all just kill all the spiders there. So no more spiders, no more pigeons. He said, no, no. Why would you know? Why would spiders be there? Because they, there's easy food for them in the left portion. You, you kill the spiders, new spiders will come back. He said, there are a lot of ants in the left portion. He said, let's do one thing. Block the ants holes, no more ants, no more pigeons, no more spiders, no more pigeons. I said, no, no, would you know why would ants be there? Because the entrance of the museum is from the left side and people are not allowed to bring food into the museum. They confiscate the food and they keep it somewhere where they, because of which their ants are there and because of ants, they're spiders, because of spiders, they're pigeons. And ultimately you look at a wall which is looking dirty. Technically, I don't need to have a manager who tells me that wall is looking dirty. Anyone can tell me. I need someone who can tell me why did it happen in the first place. You don't, I don't want to do somebody a quick fix of repainting it. I need you to trace back and find where did it start from. Because you, unless and until you get down to the bottom of the root cause, you will not be able to fix the problem. It will come back again. So if in your real world, you might have tried to go and improve something, it stays improved for some time. But after that, three, four, five months, you, the problem resurfaces again. That means we have not been able to address the root cause yet. It's somewhere still there. You need to get down to the bottom of it to find what is really causing, because that's what is instigating the entire chain of the problems. And then what you see is just an outcome, but the chain is somewhere else. The root cause is somewhere else. Six Sigma works on this methodology, which in ensures that we don't try to fix a problem superficially, because that's just a quick fix. But you need to trace the origin and fix the problem so that you can get a permanent solution. You don't have to, yes, so you do a root cause analysis. We, we do a root cause analysis, there are a lot of tools and techniques. Plus, we will be using statistical techniques to find, is it a root cause? Ganesh, should I to get your, like I get your question. Uh, you will be doing a root cause analysis, there are tools. Uh, and techniques we will be talking about. How do we do a root cause analysis? Plus, uh, in general sense, we will do, uh, I'll just, I'm sure we must have heard about 5Y technique. We will use 5Y technique, but to add on to it, we will be using statistical tools to help us validate, is it the root cause or not? So we will have a statistical validation, uh, which will leave no ambiguity no confusion as to are we really, is it the root cause or not? We will be able to identify it. So yes, we will definitely get there. So that's pretty much about the problem solving methodology. So bottom line, it's all about finding the root causes, tracing the origin where it started from and killing the problem right in the bud where it originated from. So we don't have to, the problem doesn't resurface back again. That's how Six Sigma approach works. Now, coming to the next point, which talks about Six Sigma as a philosophy. Now, first it says six customer focus. Now, I just want to hear it from you. Uh, can you name a few companies which were great companies, like which are which had complete monopoly in the market, but you don't find them today? They're gone. Any name that you can think of? Companies which had great control, like they're everywhere. Honeywell, okay. Uh, Nokia, best example. Absolutely, yes. Without any doubt, Nokia, definitely yes. Uh, any, anything else that comes to your mind? IBM, okay. How about uh, BlackBerry? The only business phone we actually used for a very long time was BlackBerry. And let's see, there are tons, tons of them. Kingfisher, definitely yes. I would not disagree with that. Uh, you have these companies. Uh, were they bad companies? No, they were great companies. They were definitely great companies, but they could not keep up the pace with the changing dynamics of the market. This market is not stagnant. This market is dynamic. The, they were great, but yes, at one point in time, this market has changed by multiple times. This has changed multiple folds. We need to understand that yes, my customer is changing. The paying pattern is changing. The behavior is changing. Everything is changed is changing. We need to ensure that my product or service must change.
which as the as the market changes it must be in sync with the changing dynamics of the market if i don't keep up the pace soon i will be outdated and i'll be obsolete that's what happened to these big brands it you have to continually revive and ensure that you are meeting the the trends of the market it's it's important that we got to we can't be rigid that this is what we offer and we won't change unless until you're an iphone and still iphone keeps on coming with innovation but they have upgraded everything yes thanks raju yes absolutely they keep changing keep innovating they probably are the market trend setters and everyone follows it so yes they have evolved eventually on on its own without the customers forcing that they bring the innovation but barring that if i talk about other companies they at least learn from the market and then they revive they change themselves so in that shell when we talk about customer focus six sigma approach is all about ensuring there is no variation variation means anything which is not desired by the client is a variation so six sigma helps you reduce the variation which means you should be able to deliver exactly what the customers ask for again and again again and again without any variations six sigma kills variation so you become more customer focused you always aligned with the customer if your customer behavior changes your product or service will change accordingly because you are judging your performance with respect to customers requirements as your customer requirements change so would your performance change and that's what six sigma enables you to achieve now if i move on to the second point it says employee engagement now employee engagement is a wonderful thing i would definitely want to vouch out for this one because a lot of corporates have this uh fundamental like they uh we we do a lot of uh like team bonding exercises in every organization we do a lot of things like parties events uh like we spend a lot of money as a as a business owners they people do a lot of activities to bring together teamwork everyone wants that good companies i'm having said that i'm not saying that those companies are bad but good companies will invest in their people good companies like a lot of companies conduct these six sigma trainings within the organization we do a lot of corporate tra trainings why do a company be interested to do a six sigma training for these employees because it helps them ensure see once a six sigma training is done you have people coming from every department hr operations quality admin think about every department they join in the training session they take the training they go back to the respective departments and then they start six sigma projects keep this in mind six sigma project is cannot be done by a single person it's not a one man show you need a team six sigma project is a teamwork project you always need a team so it helps you a, a you have invested in the people definitely yes it they go to their respective departments and then they create a team and start doing projects so you'd see 360 degree improvement in every department every area people start doing project and all in all you're driving the team culture also it's this is why it helps them a get their the organizational benefits or motives driven plus drive the team culture also it works well so good companies have used this as a tool to drive a six sigma basically team culture also team behavior also using six sigma projects one you can't do it in silo you must have a team you create a team there that's how it works and finally it says defect to this defect and variation so this taste to defect and variation it simply as uh see the moment i my i i have a defect in my product or service cuz this market is so unforgiving now uh see i uh, say if i don't like my electricity provider can i change it i don't have a choice if it's good or bad i have to live with it uh, i don't li like my water supplier can i change it well that's what i get from my government i i can't change it there's no choice now wherever customer has choice customer will not give you a second chance you have you are just an option so in this world when you customer is spending say 100 dollars they are not expecting value worth of 100 dollars they are expecting value worth of say 150 dollars this is not about customer satisfaction this is about customer delight can you delight the customer with your product or service satisfaction is given if you can't give 100% quality then you would be out of market customers would not give you a choice because there's so many people so many competition
information, so many options available. So you can't even forget about having a defect. So the moment you have defect in your product or services, you will be kicked out from the market. And that's how it works. So it's all about developing a like mindset where you treat every single defect, every single variation as a big cardinal sin. It's not like, okay, we'll see to it. No, everything will be, every single defect will be criticized, analyzed, interrogated. We will not let it go. How did it happen? That's how a mindset needs to change. That's what it says, creating a mindset which talks about distaste to defect innovation. In the end, everyone in the organization must keep the eyes and ears open for something which is undesirable for the customer from beginning to end from top to bottom like even a housekeeping guy should be so clear about as to what is his or her role in revenue like if i don't keep my premise clean somebody might get infected who will not report to office and eventually that will impact the revenue so everyone should be that clear it takes time you have to create that culture so this is more of the mindset stuff we are talking about now, that's about the philosophical part. Now, coming to next thing, which is Six Sigma as a metric. Now, when we say Six Sigma as a metric, why I'm talking about as a metric? Metric is a way we measure it. There are various ways we learn about all of these. Uh, you may call it a Z score if you're going by a British accent, or you may go with a Z score if you're going by a US accent. So I'll go with a British one right now, Z score. Uh, CPCPK, PPPPK, there are different ways how you calculate sigma level, DPMO. So we learn about all of them, how sigma level needs to be calculated for different kind of data. You know this methods, pretty much you will be able to calculate sigma level for everything. But why am I call, talking it as a metric? Why is it a metric? Now, just to get give an answer, say, for example, I have different departments. I have got a training department. Let me just quit training department. I've got quality, I've got HR, I've got admin, I've got finance, I've got marketing, I've got sales, and say uh, we've got uh, which which one more department probably uh, say transport, like whatever. We have various departments within my organization. As a business owner, I want to reward the best organized, best department. First of all, help me understand. Should I be comparing these departments? Is it fair to compare these departments? Which, which is my best department? How would I compare them? Training, quality, HR, admin. Is it fair? Shirley says no. Should I be comparing them? No. Okay. okay. Uh, so the answer is yes, we should be. I can being very honest, yes. We should be. Why not? Again, so I have a basic question. I just want to know which is my best department. Simple as that. I am business owner. I want to evaluate them. Which is my best department? Simple as that. Again, so I'm not trying to be like this. Definitely, if I'm unfair, then definitely there's a big problem. I want to be fair and I want to still judge who is my best department. Now, how do I judge them? They are different departments, they have different job roles. And I would like, how would I compare a training with a quality and admin with a like a sales? How it doesn't matter, doesn't make sense. Yes, what I can do is I can calculate, like, because right now it's like comparing apple with oranges. I should not be comparing them in an ideal scenario, but now I can calculate, like, I'm randomly putting some numbers. Say, let me just give me one quick moment. One, two, six. This is just random numbers. just random numbers and just forgive me if in case you you feel it as well but i'm just putting any random numbers i can calculate the sigma level so i can basis so i'm not comparing and right now anything with anything else i have training department they have their own job role their individual departmental targets kras whatever they have based on that i can calculate the the sigma level for the training team now I can talk, go to quality team, look at the KRAs set by the internal departments and everything based on their KRAs. I'm not judging them on someone else's KRA. I'm not judging quality on sales KRA, no. I will judge them on quality KRAs, whatever has been given. Based on that, I will calculate the Sigma level. So every department can, I can get a Sigma level. This has evolved as a new universal metric, which is independent of every, every department. Now, 
I, I have a clear number which tells me that my best department is my finance department, pretty much. They are meeting their job role expectations better than anyone else. That's the high best department. My worst department probably is like these two departments, which are like doing pathetic quality and admin. They're not doing a great job. Whatever is there, and, and having said that, I am these, they were not just on someone else's scale, like uh, rules and responsibility. They were supposed to deliver 100% of their individual department target. And basis that, basis their own individual KRAs, their departmental goals, I'm judging their sigma level. And I'm trying to be fair enough. I can compare anything with anything. There is no limitation. So Six Sigma as a metric helped us to take decisions. Decision making became easier. Things which were not comparable became comparable. One manager is managing 500 people, another manager managing only 50 people. I can compare them. I can see who's better manager. Let's let me calculate Sigma level. Sigma level helped you come up with a new universal metric, which can be used in everything, anything and everything you compare, uh, like things which are uncomparable. And then decision-making, the concept of dashboarding came into picture. People, it helps you uh, take rational decisions. Uh, like you don't want to be taking decisions basis, my gut feeling, well, my experience says, I feel like, no, sorry. We believe in data, we look at numbers and we take decisions. There's no space. I completely respect your opinion. I completely respect your judgment, gut feeling, but let me look at data first. Data speaks for itself. You don't have to explain too much. Again, I'm not sure how many of us would have heard uh, this Infosys chairman. We have uh, uh, Narayan Krishnamurti. He says, I believe in God, but for everything else, I need data. That's how it is. Data speaks for itself. So that's how uh, the Six Sigma uh, is used as a metric to take rational decisions where we're not being biased to anyone. We will be taking rational decisions based on facts, based on data. And finally, Six Sigma is a management system. So different organizations take Six Sigma as a tool or a technique to implement a management system. What are those? One, we have already talked about DMAIC, DMAC. The other one is says DMA, DV, and DFSS. So let's have a look at it. So I'll just copy paste this DMAC and let's understand what is the basic difference between them. So DMAC is here. The other one is also DMA. This is then DV. This stands for design. This is verify. And this another synonym for this is DFSS, which is it stands for design for six sigma. Now let's have a basic understanding. What do we, when do we use a DMAC framework, and when do we use a DMA DV framework or DFSS, which is same. So these two are DMA DV, or you call it as DFSS, which pretty much talking about the same thing. Now, when do we use DMAC? First of all, that's what we will be learning. DMAIC. That's the original version of Six Sigma. Uh, first, if I have a process, and I'm not happy with the process. The complaints, escalations, things are not getting controlled. That means I have a process which is not doing fine. I need to improve. So I'm talking about process improvement. If there is a process which is doing good, but I feel I can do better. Again, I'm talking about process improvement. So for this, I need to have an existing process. If there is an existing process, which is either doing good or bad, I need to improve it. That means we will be dealing with process improvement. You will be implementing a DMAIC. Technically, you always have a process. Everywhere there is a process which needs an improvement. And that's when we go and implement a DMA. So 99% of the time, you will always be implementing a DMAIC method only. Now, what is this DMADB? DMADB is when you create a new product or service as per client requirement. Your client is expecting you to deliver a new product or new service as per his or her expectations. You design a new, so that's why it says design for Six Sigma because it starts at the level of Six Sigma altogether because you're creating something new, you're crafting something new, a product or service as per the expectations of the client. You're meeting the expectation. You start at Six Sigma level altogether because you're creating something from scratch, absolutely from scratch. And that's why this is generally people in research and development, people in IT industry, not specifically in IT, people in like software development, they are the one who work with DMA, DV version, because you take your requirements from the client. Well, my client comes back and says, well, uh, 
uh, we want a new software to be designed, which should give me this report. It should have this functionality, that functionality, and all sorts of stuff analysis it needs to do. Well, the client has specific requirements. I'll learn the requirements. I'll understand them. I'll analyze them. I'll create a design. I'll check whether does that meet my client expectation. Well, that's where I starting at Six Sigma level, when I create and craft a new software, which meets my client expectation from the word go. From the word go, it meets the expectation of the client. That's when we go with DFSS. The tool and technique which makes it more complex here, this is something which we it's covered in the black belt. So this is the, and the, basically the technique which gets used here is something called DOE, which is design of experiments, which is a little more complex in terms of statistics, uh, which is which gets covered, but like it's out of scope for at a green belt level, but in black belt, that's what makes it a little different. So uh, in a black belt, you definitely need to know uh, DMAIC, but the additional thing which you end up learning is DMADV, which is more like a basic, an advanced, little bit advanced version where you get into a DOE, which uh, helps you create those new product or service using statistical method. So you designing and everything happens through a statistical method. And then you verify stat statistically whether it's working or not. And then pretty much you meet the expectation of the client. That's how it works. So sort of uh, out of out of scope for us in this one, but yes, anyone who wants to go for a black belt later on, will be covering, will be going through a DOE uh, methodology in there, in the black belt part. So that's pretty much the four different types of classification. Uh, of Six Sigma, industry-wise, how people have classified Six Sigma. Uh, anyone has questions so far, whatever we have covered, please do let me know. Any questions? Okay, I guess we're good. I, I is, okay, perfect. All right, so uh, let's move on to the next thing. Now, where is belts? Uh, let's understand the basic hierarchy. What are the various belts in Six Sigma? Uh, so we, we are going through a green belt program, but technically there are more, more belts before a green belt also. So we'll start with the first belt, which is officially not too much common, but white belt is the first belt. It will be, it will be, uh, Roman, it will be available. Yeah, so I'm so from IMC, uh, people will be like, they share the, the recordings now. I don't have access to it. I have similar access to it like you. But yes, I have, as per my understanding, yes, they always, this is, uh, the entire session is being recorded. So this is, yeah, it's being recorded. Okay, so white belt is the first belt where we get started. Uh, not too much uh, in practice across industry, but in US, uh, yes, people go through uh, official white belt training. Uh, it's uh, like maximum one to two hours of, Awareness training. This is nothing more than awareness training. You want to sensitize uh, your people, your staff, that what is Six Sigma, how people have used Six Sigma. Probably you can talk about some case studies. How people, so pretty much people get to know what is Six Sigma. So there's a lot of people who may not know what is Six Sigma. So it will be a good journal awareness training to get your people sensitized about you. Uh, this so-called Six Sigma stuff. Uh, no official certification as such here. Uh, unless until you want to just make a big deal out of it, yes. But, but technically, there's no such official certification for that. Yes, the real work uh, gets started when you get into the next belt, which is a yellow belt. A yellow belt is someone which will be very, very, very helpful, very important for all of us, uh, because yellow belts uh, will be generally like a one-day training at the max. Uh, so this is one-day training they go through complete DMAIC. Now, just a basic overview of every tool and technique that is used in uh, Six Sigma. They go through all the tools and techniques. And so this is just basic overview so that they will understand uh, the, the language you use in Six Sigma. So they are the, these people are very useful. Why? Because they are active team members of the project. So when you when you lead a project, a green belt project, you need people to help you, right? There should be people who should understand your language. These are the people who will be uh, helping you with the project. So they, you'll be giving them instructions. They will be uh, getting things done for you because they would have gone through the DMAT framework. Uh, a one day, a quick brush up, but just they would understand. When I say we're going to do a fishbone diagram, we will be working on say a scatter plot. We, 
we will be doing a Pareto chart, they will understand that language. It will help them to understand it. So pretty much they will be connecting with you easily. Absolutely, yes, everywhere. See, uh, this is, well, uh, when we talk about project management, technically, uh, the, if you pick up a PMP syllabus and you compare with the defined phase and the PMP syllabus, you will see a lot of tools and techniques being used uh, which is there in the project management even the other phases measure analyze improve control there will be certain tools and techniques which will be using which is a part of your regular project management pmp syllabus it's the lot of tools will be covered like risk management framework is there which is fmea your roles and responsibility delegation framework is there which will be covering in this which is rasic model so it gets covered Raju. okay perfect 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 great so uh, moving on to the next belt, right? so these these people pretty much are required by us for us to ensure that uh, we have active team, team members who will be completing the job. Now, the real official belt, like official belt in terms of project leader who will lead the project will be green belt. Green belt, and then I'll parallel keep black belt so that we can compare them and see what's the difference between green belt and black belt. So basic differences, what are there? So from project management perspective. We have same level of expertise. There's no difference in green belt and black belt because in both green belt or black belt, you have to execute the entire project from beginning to end, from defined till control. So you have complete and same level of expertise in terms of project management. Yes, the difference will come when we talk about statistical knowledge. Here I will say it's low to medium. This is extensive. Absolutely, uh, because here it's more like a simple to medium sort of problems you deal with. Here you deal with really complex problems in the black belt level, uh, because you also get into the design of expert, which is very extensive. This it's more statistical in nature. And now let's come back to the the, the timelines and all. Generally, we talk about a green belt project. Green belt project would generally range between three to six months. That's the average life cycle of a green belt project. And a black belt project would generally range between nine to 12 months. That's the like average life cycle. Uh, now, when somebody becomes a green belt, do you do only green belt projects? You, do, you just get into Six Sigma? Practically not. Now, green belt projects, uh, green belt people who get green belt certified, they work, they work within their department. You don't work outside department. Somebody who is an HR professional will be doing a project, will be working within HR department. Somebody who's an operations guy will be still working in operations, but not they are these people will be working 70. 30 in a 70 30 ratio most this is not a rule or guideline but most companies use this 70 30 uh, ratio so 70 percent of the time they will still be working the, doing the original job whatever they were hired for but 30 percent of the time they will be dedicating to the project in case of a uh, six sigma project within that department so 30 percent is the project time in a black belt you are you are cross-functional you're not tied to a department you are hundred percent project resource, absolutely on the project. Now, uh, if I talk about uh, basic classification between green belt and black belt in terms of uh, the dollar impact value, different companies have different nomenclatures of calling something as a green belt project or a black belt project. Uh, in in general, uh, you can't put a number in terms of uh, this because different companies have different magnitude. Like. General Electric, they use a basic criteria that any project which is worth less than $10 million is a green belt. If it's more than $10 million, it's a black belt project. That may not be true for other companies. So yes, it depends from company to a company. The dollar value cannot be used as a guideline to say it's a green belt or black belt. More to do with the simple, like if it's a simple project, doesn't require too much of effort. Uh, the time span is less, less investment. That's a green belt project. Uh, black. So different companies use their own nomenclature of ways to identify it's a green belt or black belt. More like this is how you would see them. Now, once you uh, like talk about green belt, black belt, then you have a master black belt. That's the final level uh, in the Six Sigma journey. So master black belt will be a experience.
experienced black belt. So this, what is the role of this person? An experienced black belt. Like, and again, the, the conditions change vary from company to company where you get the certification done from with minimum of 15 to 20 projects. The person would have done a minimum. This is expectation eligibility criteria projects to be covered in Six Sigma journey. And you should have at least minimum of 80 hours of trading because these people would have done these projects in multiple domains, departments, so that they have a fair bit of idea how projects project needs to be done in different industries. And they will be working as more of a mentor or a guide. Uh, they will be, a uh, black belt would be carrying out minimum 12 to 15 projects at a time. So they will be mentoring minimum uh, one time they will have a lot like they will be either doing uh, some managing or mentoring some green belt people they'll be mentoring black belt so green belt people will be managing green belt projects black belt people will be managing green belt and black belt projects both but all in all they will have somebody who's their mentor who will be master black belt will be kind of helping them if they get stuck somewhere by the virtue of the experience the knowledge they will be more of a mentor or a guide okay i'll just go back to the chat they use a green belt to find a new rule. That is fine. Absolutely. Yes. Without any doubt, Renzel, see, we, having this certification uh, like definitely uh, allows you to get into a uh, different uh, role without any doubt. But having a project management experience definitely uh, gets you uh, like a better chance of getting through uh, in case you have any project management, like whatever, whichever industry company you're working in, uh, definitely try to explore and seek for some project, just like any project, and just, just try to find not a big value project, but a simple green belt project will do. Seek for a project and just probably, even if you have implemented one green belt project, that will be more than enough for you because you will have a practical understanding of implementing it. And secondly, uh, that serves as a like as a guidance for uh, like a like sort of confidence, gives confidence to the recruiters that yes, you gain some knowledge and you know how to do it. So. Uh, but yes, it definitely you can you can use this people. This will be good enough for you to kind of seek for a new role. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Oh, yes, <laughs> you are right, Roman. So you are absolutely right. It's just a matter of preference. See, uh, different people have different uh, ways of kind of putting these labels. Uh, all in all. Uh, this nobody is just teaching six sigma nowadays. It's a it's a uh, lean six sigma. So it's just what how you want to put it. So yeah, it's funny. I, technically, okay. Just want to add to it. If at all you see orange belt and blue belt also, please just ignore because uh, there are various. No, see every there are there are a lot of marketing companies like so they try to kind of create more levels uh, so that people can get continue to win this ladder of kind of going to the next level, next level. So they they have we have. Some companies even come with orange belt and blue belts, and yeah, it's get, getting a rainbow. And uh, then there are green belt level one, level two, black belt level one, level two. So pretty much the people have started creating more levels just to make more money. But technically, that's the belts. Now, that's the Six Sigma team. So we'll kind of quickly go here. That's my Six Sigma team. So depending on a black belt, how many, how complex is the project, uh, they can have green belts. Uh, or yellow belts reporting into them. Uh, a green belt will have yellow belts reporting into them, depending on the magnitude of the project. Now, the two more people we should know, like which are aligned, they are not a part of Six Sigma. Six Sigma team ends here. Now that's where these two crucial people which are involved, one is sponsor, another is champion. So let me quickly just give you an idea about what, what is their role, sponsor and champion. So sponsor in the language of project management, like we're talking about project management, uh, sponsor is the one who just funds the project, nothing else. Funding of the project, that is all. So generally the CEO, CXO, CTOs of the organization, uh, VP of the organization will be generally the sponsor, who will fund the project, who will give money for the project. That is, uh, yeah, so it will be part of the project charter preparation, will be definitely there. But yes, the core, core role is to fund the project. The most critical person for us as a Six Sigma professionals will be the champion. The most critical person, because the, what's the role of the champion? We'll just kind of add in here. The champion is generally head of department. So head of whatever department we generally, so what, whatever, whichever department we're trying to do a 
project and jali is the the head of the department is the is the champion now champion uh, is a key person why because the project review approval or rejection is handled by the champion sponsor is going to so the project success or failure is responsibility of champion this champion will be responsible for so you need to just convince the champion if the champion is convinced by the project approval with the we will approve it if they want some more clarifications or questions will be asked by the champion because ultimately this person has to answer to the sponsor because this person will see the funds and funds will be allocated by the by the approval of the champion so champion needs to answer uh, the the sponsor in the end so technically the project success or failure lies is the complete responsibility of uh, the champion and then this person is definitely the stakeholder yes right uh, so pretty much this person will be asking too many questions will be harsh will be will be uh, demanding and hence it's very it's imperative for us as a team to ensure that uh, the champion is pretty clear about what is happening in the project if there are any roadblocks so you need more funds you need resources you need anything if you are get if there is a, if something is not happening right you must ensure the champion is always aware of it and the whatever needs to be done this person will be able to get things done for you so champion is a key person for us because most of our communication is going to happen with the champion this person will be uh, in like we will be talking about uh, something called toll gate reviews so every time every phase define phase will get over measure phase will get over analyze phase will get over after end of every phase the dmaic that we talked about after end of every phase there is a review which is done a management review which is done after every phase that is done by the champion so champion and the sponsor will be a part of this uh, uh, any any key people who are risk like involved in this the stakeholders will be part of that meeting where you will be uh, explaining what like will you'll you'll be kind of uh, reviewed on what whatever we have covered in that previous phase uh, what are the challenges what could be done better so during this those meetings you will be able to kind of reallocate re redefine the goals and pretty much uh, things get improvised as you move forward in the project but every phase and there will be a review done and that will be primarily led by the champion so a lot of questioning and in like a sort of interrogation is done by the champion because ultimately this person is going to be answerable for everything in the end so that's how the uh, basic core team structure looks like is is the, is that clear to everyone okay okay yes, of, yeah for yeah, a moment please. I have yeah. a question though. Um, so the champion is not necessarily uh, a, a, a belt holder, right? Or even no, the sponsor. No. You're right. Absolutely right. So the champion may be a belt holder, may not be. So the, the belt, the Six Sigma, the expectation of having Six Sigma knowledge ends here. Up to Master Black Belt. These people, sponsor or champion, may or may not have knowledge of Six Sigma. That is absolutely correct. So rightly pointed out. So if you know that these people don't know the language of Sigma level, don't use it with them. Simple as that. It is very important. So, well, probably my champion or sponsor, they don't understand when I say my process is working at 3.25 Sigma. Well, that doesn't make sense to me. I should, you should be able to explain me that in percentages because, so depending on your stakeholders, because you, you need to understand who you're talking to. We will have the understanding of uh, converting a percentage to Sigma, Sigma to percentage. We can do that back and forth, but yes, you need to understand your sponsor. So we are your, your stakeholders rightly ask this question. Yes. Sponsor and champion may or may not be Six Sigma professionals, no necessity. So yes, but by the virtue of the role they are in, they will be higher up in reviewing them because they have a like a broader picture or vision of the organization where they want to take it. So definitely yes. I hope that answers the question. Okay. All right. So pretty much the next thing is what we have is uh, when to implement a lean six Sigma project. So we have. Uh, few blocks here and we just want to understand like what to what like which tool we'll be using in what kind of scenario and when do we ultimately end up using clean six sigma uh, so first thing it says uh, if the complexity of a problem is low it, 
It's a simple problem and you also know the solution. Then why even, why care about doing a Six Sigma project? You know the problem, you, the, it's not a big deal and you know the solution, just go and fix it. Just don't do a project because you just feel like doing a project. It's, it's because it needs cost. It will be a lot of things which stay. So you don't want to do a project because you feel like doing it. Simple as that. You are dealing with a problem which is less complex and you don't know the solution also. So again, you don't need to do the complete project. Six Sigma is a collection of tools and techniques. You can use something out of it. Don't need to do complete project, complete DMAC. No, you have a simple problem. You don't know the solution. Use certain problem solving tools and techniques. You will be able to solve it. No need of kind of following the entire drill. You can, you are the best judge. You know, okay, well, this problem, I can sort it out with this simple technique. Let's kind of solve it. Yes, absolutely. Uh, it's like a SWOT kind of thing. Coming to the uh, the lead latter part, this is where it gets a little complex uh, in terms of the problem is complex, highly complex. And we know the solution. Now, what kind of situation would that be? I'll just kind of explain. But keep this in mind, this is highly complex, but we know the answers to the problem. Uh, this is, will be solved by Lean or Kaizen. So I'll just kind of go back and kind of explain this. Say for example, I'm taking sort of an example for a manufacturing kind of setup, just to give you a quick heads up. Say there is a client uh, who has placed the order. The client has placed some sort of order. They need some products to be manufactured. So the client, once the client places an order, this order comes to say the production planning team. The production planning team gets the order they analyze the order. In turn, they have some raw material supplier. And they have their production unit also. This is production team. So once they have analyzed the order, they know, they estimate what is the, what amount of raw material will be required. So though they coordinate with the raw material supplier that you need to supply this basis, this order, you need to supply so-and-so raw material at so-and-so frequency to the production team. So they they give some instructions to the raw material team then some similar instructions are carried out to production team that you we have received a new order please start manufacturing this is what we need to complete and they kind of they provide the material they manufacture the product now once the product is manufactured that goes for quality testing what's good or bad so once the quality testing is completed then this needs to go for some packaging things so it needs to be packaged like once that's done then it goes to this uh, logistics and finally your client, the customer, the cust client gets the products. Basic, basic, very simple journey. Now, uh, isn't, is this a complex, like a highly complex one? Uh, technically, yes, it's a complex chain. It's, it's just looks like four or five different steps, but no, production planning team has so many processes in, in, in themselves the coordination between production planning team and raw material supplier there's again a lot of processes there also the raw material supplier needs to provide it to the store it goes to the store and then from there to the production team production team itself has a lot of processes in itself so go then the quality testing team then the pack every department has their like a lot of processes so it's a collection of multiple processes and a lot of departments where things can go wrong so when the client says at this stage say client starts complaining your client is not happy. A, there's a quality issue. There's a delay issue. There could be, client could be complaining about n number of things. There's a defective product. There's a, the product has reached late. When I received the product, it was damaged, all that stuff. Bottom line, this is the entire chain where it started from. If it's a quality issue, uh, why did quality miss it out? Like if, so pretty much they did get damaged during the, log the, the transportation. So pretty much the problem arises anywhere here. Do we know the problem, the source? Yes, if the client complains about delay, we need to understand did the raw material supply, supply the material on time? Did the production team complete the job on time? Was when it was completed, did quality team complete the quality testing on time? It was done, then what was the packaging done? So when we go and deep dive into every area, we will be able to find out what's my problem. But because it's so complex, so many processes are involved, it's highly complex, but we always know the solution. We always know the problem solution, but only so we can solve it with the help of lean. Lean, we already talked about. Lean is about removing waste, unwanted stuff, which is making it complex. Too many processes, unwanted steps. We just kill that, make a complex process, a simplified one. Lean solves that.
that for us. So Lean is all about simplifying it. Before we move on to the other part, we just quickly want to talk about Kaizen. Just a small, not too much of into it, but basic stuff we should know, basic difference between Lean and Kaizen. So we understand Lean is a management tool. Kaizen is ground level stuff, I would say. That's, that's why we put it across. So basic difference we've got to keep in mind. Kaizen cannot happen before your lean has been implemented. That's how I will put it across. And please correct me if in case you feel anywhere, it's 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 not sinking in fine. Let me let me give you this is management tool. Why? See, first of all, when we need to do any kind of improvement, process improvement, sensitize people for some drive, continual improvement, and all that stuff. Uh, you need to ensure that the mind of the people there, because people are rigid, people oppose change, they don't want to change. So you have to create the culture, lean culture needs to be created, adopted by people. The management has to do a lot of, lot of things in terms of training, cross training, rewarding people, rewarding people, implementing 5S and a lot of other tools and techniques so that you hear. So in case of lean, right now you need to prepare the people. People are raw. People are not open for change. So here you have to inculcate the habit of change management. So people, this is all role of management. Like the top management needs to inculcate this behavior of change management. People should become receptive to change. This is where you will be talking about a lot of training, cross trainings. So empowering people, skill. You need to like empower people with the required skill. Tomorrow you want to launch the lean improvement. You want to ensure that people are empowered. So you have to provide them required resources, tools, and techniques so that they are empowered. Once people are empowered, then Kaizen gets kicked. Kaizen is ground level stuff. Kaizen is all about small, 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 small improvement. It's not a big deal. It's a small, small improvement where everyone comes to a job. See, my motive in Kaizen is when, as I say, if I'm a machine operator, as a machine operator, when I come to my job, I sh I want to do something which will make my tomorrow better, even by 0.01%, that's Kaizen. Simplest way, smallest unit of change, if, if I can bring in, the objective is like, so it's, it's, it's we got to keep this in mind. The word which is always associated with Kaizen is continual, continual improvement. That means never ending improvement. There's a basic difference. People say it's continuous improvement. Keep this in mind. That's incorrect. And never mention that when you're mentioning Kaizen. Kaizen is all about continual improvement. Basic difference in continuous and continual. Just kind of try to draw this. This is one improvement. It goes up. This is continuous. It started and it ended. It, it, was, it had no stoppage. This is continuous. It ends in continuous. It has a definite beginning and without stoppage. Continual is this. Never ending. Small, 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 small increment energy. Every day, even if my change brings in 0.001% improvement, that's Kaizen. So it's about small, small incremental change, which everyone, see every ground level staff starts bringing in some basic change, some slightest change in the process, the way they operate, just to make their tomorrow better. That's about Kaizen. When will it happen? When your people are empowered with the required skills, tools, and you've done that as management. Sit back and relax as management. Let these people take up. When, when hundreds and hundreds of stakeholders will come in place. Right now, you had like four or five people who were top management. Now, every single person has, has started treating themselves as a respective stakeholder for whatever they do. You can sit and relax. They have owned your process, your company. Every single person will bring about a change. Small, small incremental change. Add up everyone's change. It will be a big, massive change. Kaizen will kick in only after you, you have given the required input. The upbringing has to be done correctly by Lean so that Kaizen can happen. You can't just go back to people and say, give me some Kaizen, give me improvement initiative. No, no. You haven't done anything to for them to react that way. So people, unfortunately, in real world, when we go and see, we will just go and ask people, well, give me some Kaizen ideas, guy, give me Kaizen. Well, you can't, can't have these people that don't have their mind conditioned to think that way. So you can't do that. First thing first, you've got to invest time in people. That's how it is. Uh, okay, coming back to this question, what is the what if the problem is related to quality of product, of product or services? Uh, see, if it's related to quality of product, uh, 
So pretty much where did it start? Uh, like you have to go and trace back and in this uh, case, you have to go back and trace the quality of the products. You have to retrace back. Where did it start? If the so quality testing team, team missed out some some quality related testing. So practically there was something which was wrong been produced here. So was it a fault in the production team when they manufactured, they, they produced a manufacturer like faulty product, which was skipped by quality testing team. That if that's the case, then we know for sure there's something wrong here. Or if if they are getting a wrong material, was there was there some some we'll retrace back. See, everything we'll need to go and retrace back to see where did it start from. That will happen. But ultimately we'll know always where it is getting originated from. Who is the culprit? We will retrace back. The answer lies here only. Bottom line, we'll always know the answer. If we do a deep dive in it, we'll know the answer. I hope that answers your question. Okay, so that's that's about the, the uh, lean and Kaizen part. Coming to this this zone, which is highly complex problem and you don't know the solution. So to answer this question, like pretty much, I would definitely want to have a simple question, like simple thing so that we can understand when to implement Six Sigma. That, that's what we would like to keep this in mind. When do we explain? The change management is more about like conditioning people. So you see people are not, used to change so implementing various uh, uh, trainings because when you when you go back and say somebody has been doing job in a particular way so traditional mindset is always there it's very difficult for uh, anyone in management to go and enforce a change unless and until you, you prepare people through a lot of trainings tools and techniques you would not be find people uh, opening up or they're being open because natural tendency is always to oppose change so you need to, as a management, do some sort of training, sensitize people, help them understand, educate people how this change will help them uh, with in, in terms of improving their own working standards. So, so some more of the training part. That's what I'm talking about. Managing the mindset. It's more of a psychological aspect. The conditioning of mind is more important from that perspective. That's what I was talking about. Is that okay? Okay, perfect. Now... When do we use Six Sigma is the next question. Say, I'm, I'm for just for an example, say I'm a, a merchant who sells a product on uh, e-commerce portal. Like I have a portal, uh, like just for an example, I sell uh, on Amazon. I'm a merchant. Now, what's my product is a kids friendly paper plane, uh, aeroplane or paper plane, what we call uh, kids friendly paper plane. That's what I sell on Amazon. Now I have few vendors who manufacture this paper plane for me. I have very simple requirement from all my vendors that whenever you uh, whenever you have got this, like uh, when you manufacture, keep this in mind, this basic requirements. A, the plane has to be uh, like uh, colorful because kids love colorful plane. Um, I want to have my logo because I want to do my branding. So I'm brand conscious. I want that to be kids friendly. I should not, don't want sharp edges. Otherwise kids will cut their finger which I don't want. And finally, because it's a paper plane, plane, it must fly. So it should fly at least five meters. That's what I want. I have basic requirements for my vendor. Now, for example, if I start rejecting one of my vendor's plane because they are not colorful, do you think my vendor needs to do a Six Sigma project for that? Is there a need for doing a Six Sigma project because I'm, I'm rejecting the paper plane? saying that your planes are not colorful. No, absolutely no. So there's a simple, straightforward problem, simple problem, simple solution, simple, straightforward solution. Just do it approach. So just don't do a project because you feel like doing it. So simple problem, simple solution. It does not have my logo. Simply put the logo. Why even care about doing a project? Kids, it's not kids friendly. I can touch the plane. I can touch, I can see it's sharp edges. Go and make it blunt. I can't use it. Simple as that. Well, I have tried to fly the plane at least 15, 20 times. It flies about one and a half meters, two meters. It's not flying five meters. Is this a simple problem or a complex problem? Is it a simple or a complex? It's a complex one. Yes, absolutely. It's a complex problem. Now, what could be the possible reasons here? Why my plane may not be flying five meters? 
You can unmute yourself or use the chat option. Design, absolutely, yes. Aerodynamics, design, quality, absolutely, yes. What else? The force at which I'm trying to fl probably fly the plane, uh, whether it's indoor or outdoor. Oops. Environment, absolutely. Material, size. Person who is trying to fly the plane is the person trained or not? The height from which I'm trying to fly the plane. Design we have covered aerodynamics. Uh, I guess like and see we can we can brainstorm and we can get this list long enough. But in nutshell, so we just barely just took about two three minutes and we have got like a list of say I guess seven eight different problems. And if we get somebody who is technical we can probably expand this list to a good 20, 30 problems also. Somebody who's really technical can get into technical specifications and we can get a long, long list of this. But just for now, let's keep it to this. We've got like, how many? One, two, uh, let me expand this. We've got nine different problems for, for now. Now, which one should I be start, which one should I start working on? Uh, because there seems to be a problem with my, the flight of the plane. Which one should I work on? Anyone wants to pitch in? Which one should I work on? Number one, material. Uh, you're using design and you're saying material. Okay. But do you really know is the designer really the problem? Do, would, you, would you know is, is design the real problem? But not really, absolutely. So why even try to fix something which is not even broken? Is quality, so aerodynamics, is that a problem? Well, I don't know. That could be a possible problem. I can't uh, say no to it because it's definitely can be a problem, but I don't know. So will I start working on it? Probably not. Is quality a problem? It can be a possible reason, but I don't know. Is the force at which I'm trying to fly a plane, is that sufficient force? What should? What is the right force? Well, I don't know. Is when I'm trying to fly it indoor, outdoor, well, that could be a possible reason, but is that a problem with my plane? I don't know. Possibly, yes, I don't, I'm not clear. Environment, size, person. So all these are possible reasons, but I have no clarity here. So these are all possible reasons. Now, here you knew the problem exactly. This is the problem, this is the solution. You, when you know the problem, you always have solutions. Every organization has technical experts, people who are uh, who have tons of experience, who have got their technical education in that particular field. You tell them the problem the very next minute you have your solution. But here, what would you work on when you don't know the problem? You have possible reasons, yes. But which one would, are your technical experts going to work on? We do not have that clarity. Well, everything is a possible reason. You could get a list of 20, 30 different problems. But I'm not going to work on 20, 30 different problems when I don't know which ones. Do you want me to start working on everything, which is not even like, which may not be even problem. Say out of those 20, 30 different possible, possible reasons, probably two of them or three of them could be the real reason. So then I'll be wasting a lot of time and money, which is, which is wrong. So practically, this is where there is ambiguity, where I do not have clarity. Everything could be a possible reason. Yes but I have no idea, is it the real problem or not? That's when I need, that's when I need Six Sigma. Now Six Sigma will come in and tell me what Six Sigma will help me. Exactly which ones out of these are the real ones because of which like the plane is not Flying five meters. First, this. Secondly, how much each factor is impacting the flight? You tell this information to your technical experts, they will solve your problem in a, in a moment. Practically, you just not need to give them the, the real reasons. You know, tell them the reasons, they'll solve it. Every technical expert, every organization has those key technical experts, they have it, they're subject matter experts, just tell them. But other than that, you're also able to
tell them, see, out of the, the entire whatever list of problems we have, this problem is impacting this much, this problem is impacting this much. That's a great insight. You know what's causing maximum damage to the flight, the problem. This could be cause, this problem could, right now we're talking about flight. In a real world scenario, you could be dealing with cost of some product. You may be dealing with time related issues, whatever is your business problem. So when you find each and every problem, what is causing that problem and how much is that impacting your business? That's a great side of insight. We know that what's causing and how much is that's impacting. Just hand it over to your business, your technical experts. They will solve it for you. So that's what uh, we do in Six Sigma. We try to ensure that we just don't go and try to fix everything. We try to find the real problem through statistical methods, through statistical methods, tools, and techniques. We'll exactly know what's causing the problem, and we will give the we'll take the right action. We won't get into everything. We'll just specifically target what's causing. We'll know how much we need to address which particular problem. That's how we go about addressing the problem in a Six Sigma world. So uh, that's about the basic into the part of your Six Sigma journey. Like anyone has any questions about whatever we covered uh, till now? Is it okay with everyone? Uh, yes, it is okay. Fine. Perfect, perfect. Uh, let's move on. Like so, that's that's where we probably get we get to the end of the introduction part of it. Now we'll just start with basic. I don't think, given the time we have, we will be able to cover most of it. But yes, we we'll, most likely will try to utilize this time to get a basic outline, like a framework of what we will be covering in the defined phase. What's what are the components of defined phase? And we'll try to kind of put together all those, whatever we can, given the time we have. So first thing first, in the defined phase, what we will be covering up. What do we do in defined phase? In a project kind of scenario. So not going by the theory, theory mode. I'm trying to take this up the way a real project in real world will go through. What, is, what, will, be, what will be the sequence of events that, that will be carried out in real project. When somebody comes and tells, says, we have a problem, let's do a six sigma project. So what is the right order? Uh, I would say right order, but generally the typical order, how projects uh, should be kind of carried out, what will come first, what will come second, the sequencing. So first thing first, uh, I'm just trying to put together broad classification first of all. Number one, we have first question to understand the problem. So first thing, it's always said a problem well defined is half solved. That's how we go about it. So we first would like to understand the problem and define the problem. Those two questions, then we have got understand the process where the problem is happening. And number four, we have to define the process where the problem is happening. While we do this, we use certain project management tools and techniques which are used. One is communication plan. Then we have RASIC. In PMP, you will see RACI. In Six Sigma, we use RASIC. We have an extra S in this model. And then we have uh, FMEA. Now, FMEA is something which we'll cover up, not here, I just can, which we will be discussing later uh, in the improve phase. So we'll discuss in improve phase and there is a reason why we'll be doing it later but it gets constructed here itself in the defined phase itself so but yeah we'll, we'll study this later for a specific reason uh, because this gets created here in the defined phase and keeps getting updated in every phase so we'll cover it up in the improve phase but all in all uh, this is something which we start in the defined phase itself so we'll, we'll in which we will be discussed we'll, so these are basic tools that we'll be using in the defined phase. Now we try to kind of put together all required elements which we have we need in the defined phase. Say, for example, I'll just take a very, very simple example, a simple example so that everyone can relate with it because we come from different backgrounds, different industries. So we'll try to use a very generic example, which everybody can relate with. The objective is to understand the concept, right? And if we understand the concept, we can definitely relate with our industry related problem, whatever we're dealing with. So uh, sort of a simple, simple problem, like say if I have a restaurant, like I have a restaurant in Excel and as a business owner, I have a, like I'm 
go through a very bad phase. Like I have a restaurant which is like almost like two decades old. It's very much renowned in the city. Uh, but last six months, something has gone wrong. I don't know what. People have stopped coming to my restaurant. Like very few people come. Uh, the new customers are very low. Even the old repeated customers, they have stopped coming. So I have less people coming to a restaurant. If it continues at the same rate, I will be out of business. That's how it looks like. So I need somebody to help me with my uh, problem. This is a complex problem because uh, I don't know what's causing the, this. Uh, all in all, as a business owner, I see less people. My revenues have gone down. My cost is still high. So it's, it's a very bad situation to be in. So where do I start? Where do I start six of a project? Here it's a complex situation, yes. Uh, so I need to first understand the problem. I just can't start the problem. Like I just can't just start a six single project just because you come up with a problem. I need to understand the problem in reality. Like what's causing, what's, where is the problem, real problem? So first thing first, we start with understanding the problem. A few basic tools and techniques which we'll be covering here. First, we collect voice of customer. VOC stands for voice of customer. Let's hear it from the customer. How, what is, what is bothering you? So let's hear it from the customer as to what's wrong. Why you've kind of stopped coming to a restaurant? Why do you, do you like a product service? Whatever you're dealing with, whatever industry you're in. So can you tell me like some methods how we collect voice of customer? Anyone who wants to share? What are the different ways how we can collect surveys? Yes, absolutely, yes, surveys. So we can do survey. What else? Simple questionnaire would help. Absolutely, questionnaire, feedback, reviews, polling, testimonials, focus group. Perfect, so we've got like a pretty, uh, like a, well worst uh, audience here like so, we, uh, so most of those are very very commonly used ones definitely yes so different ways you collect cust the opinion of the customer as to what's wrong either your product or service but in the end it's your customers which is unhappy something which is not right which is bothering the customer let's hear it from the customer what's wrong now once you collect this voice of customer you have a raw data like it's it's unmanageable. You can't make sense out of this raw data. So you need to first of all, clean up the data. Cleaning up is very much required here. Uh, so we will be talking about some more different ways also, which we'll cover up later. We're just trying to when put together basic elements. Uh, once you get to collect voice of customer, then you need to classify VOC, classify VOC which is what we do using affinity diagram. Now, affinity diagram will help us achieve a couple of objectives. First of all, the raw data. So we, we convert the raw data to structured data for meaningful analysis. That's my first requirement which it serves. We convert the raw data so we can make sense out of what we have collected. Number two, it helps us remove duplicate uh, uh, VOCs and get us a list of unique problems or VOCs, whatever your customers are given. And further, uh, the data collected can be used for further analysis. We'll, we'll talk about that. So basically, uh, affinity diagram is something which will help us kind of regroup the ideas. This is all about regrouping the ideas. We had a raw data, absolutely raw data, which you've kind of converted into a, like a meaningful data. Uh, now you have got the clean data, which can be researched, analyzed to find the problem. You'd have a long list of possible problems here and out of which you can't work on every possible problem. You can't solve world's hunger in one day. So you need to pick the right problem. See, define phase was all about selecting the right project. So you need to select the right project here. This is where we come to prioritizing 
application of VOC. You know, select the right problem, select the right project here. What are you going to address in this project? Which one, which problem? So there are various methods, various ways, how we pick the project. So there are various ways. First, we talk about Pareto chart. Then we have for uh, Gano model, various methods. We'll discuss all of this. We have ISO 13053. 2011 version, which is ISO standard of Six Sigma. Then you have uh, weighted CTQ prioritization matrix, the viability model. You don't need to use all of them. We will be learning about all of them, but yeah, uh, you will choose as the need arises, depending on what kind of when you understand when to use what. Uh, then you have FMEA also as a method. You have uh, you have a cost time matrix. Pretty much similarly, like we have. Uh, so, like we'll be covering up most of the, these uh, now. Like say, Pareto chart we'll be covering up in analyze phase. Kano uh, model right now the defined phase. This one in defined phase. This one in defined phase this one in defined phase this one will learn and improve and this one will learn and improve different different uh, tools see this depending on who your audience is you will be using that tool uh, dip, like because that's what uh, somebody would uh, because i can i should be using same tool see if my company is so standard freak i should be using this it makes more sense well i tell them we're using a project prioritization method uh, we are selecting the right project using the ISO standard described in ISO 13053, which is Six Sigma standard. And they tell us how a project needs to prioritize. So we'll look at this model. If you if you organize, if you really want to make a great impression, you can look at viability model. So different, different methods, so they will kind of explore them. Now here, out of whatever method we select, we select a project, we find the, we select a problem that needs to be addressed because customers would have given you different kind of problem. Here you've selected the problem that we need to address in the project. Next, when you've selected the problem, the VOC has been finalized that this is the problem. You need to convert that VOC to CTQ. CTQ stands for critical to quality, which is nothing other than KPI. The KPIs that we talked about, we use something called CTQ drill down tray to find out this one this is pretty simple this is all what we do to understand the problem so right now we want to kind of drill down drill down find out the final method or kpi which we would like to resolve which we would like to improve like quality cost here would have finalized what we will be improving on once you have decided that this is the time where you need to go back to the management and tell them well you gave us a problem we did our bit of research and now here is our proposal how we intend to solve your problem and for that we need to submit a project charter that is a very common document used in every project management world people draft project charter this is very important we need to don't need to be good at it we need to be excellent in writing project charter so the one which i have like when we'll be sharing this link for you to download this has a file and just have a look at this Excel file in the defined folder. Like if you go to data files, like in the first folder, data files for class, defined folder, you'll see this Excel Word document project charter. A very nice, like a simple template, but gives you a clear, crystal clear idea how a project charter needs to be like a simple document, single page. That's what we need to fill in. But that's where the decision is taken. How to write? I didn't create it, honestly, but whosoever did this has done a very good job in drafting the guidelines to fill a project charter. You just need to read this, keep this in mind, and that should take care of writing, drafting a good project charter. It tells you what are the points you need to keep in mind while you're writing it, an example of it. It tells you for every section. It's a small document, like a small document, but it tells you what you need to keep in mind and an example of it. So you would know every small section which needs to be filled in here, like business case, what needs to be written, problem state, what needs to, so for a business problem, which you need to solve, you need to fill this document as a business, as a project leader, you need to fill this document, share with the management so that they have a favorite idea as to what do you intend to solve? What is your project plan? How would you go about like 
facing the business problem. So I would definitely recommend if you get time, do fill in this document uh, for any business problem, any hypothetical problem, whatever may be, at least get in habit of writing this so that you can uh, like see. And then when you're done, please do share with me. I'll be more than happy to review and revert with my feedback. So I'm sure you all will do a great job. But if in case it needs small tweaking here and there, uh, we can we can get that sorted out. So I would definitely encourage, think about any problem, your current organization problem or any hypothetical problem. Get, just pick up this. Uh, you can, please, please, I'll be, I'll be uh, more than happy to share, look into that, uh, Raju. So I'll be, I'll be sharing uh, the, these details with everyone, uh, like through the email. I hope, uh, given the time we have, I guess, uh, let me think, let me just quickly go back to this one. Pretty much the rest we can kind of, uh, any we can carry out tomorrow, but yes, I'll just, before we move on uh, for today, I hope if in case anyone hasn't filled this form, please do fill in. So I know everyone's email ID, so I can share this Excel sheet. A, I'll be sharing this Excel sheet because I, uh, Raju, I'll be emailing that. So you will be getting that uh, by default. But anyway, just I'm like sharing it right now. That's my email ID, but I will be, anyway, just you'll be getting email from me. So I'll be sharing this Excel sheet. I'll be sharing this, all this material for download. Uh, and I will be sharing uh, the links for you to download this mini tab and all that like training material. So you'll be getting all of that from me. Uh, so uh, I hope everyone has filled in this form. If anyone hasn't, please do fill in the form so I get your email ID so I can share it uh, with everyone. I hope uh, that should be fine uh, for everyone. Okay, please do share like in case you have any questions, any concerns, Please do not hesitate. I'll be, every feedback is great and it's, it just helps me to improve. So in case there is any feedback, I would be more than happy to take that and it'll be great. Uh, so, so yeah, please don't hesitate to share the feedback. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Uh, take good care of yourself. Let's connect tomorrow. Uh, yes, sir. Hello. Yeah, sorry. Um, I was wondering, yes, you're doing a great job. Um, everything's just okay and then your commandable language is really good so um i'm just wondering though um it's 1 30 a.m here in the philippines it's kind of late is it okay to start at least 30 minutes earlier uh see it's it's like uh i'm i've been communicated this time by imc mm -hmm. uh i'm not sure like what that if it's is it possible so i would definitely uh, uh like pass on this information to uh the imc spock uh, there. So in, if it's possible for you to also like drop in a note uh, to them, I will be in which was communicating with them to and, and like, so more where I need to check with other participants also. So I honestly am not pretty sure about that. Uh, but I will definitely be passing on this feedback. Uh, yes, please. Thank you. Sure, sure. Thank you. Take care. Great job, everyone. sir. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Let's connect tomorrow. And uh, let's take it up from there. Thank you. Thanks. A thank lot. you. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Good night. Thank you. Good night. Thank you.